Coming up, who were the women warriors of the 1973 Wounded Knee occupation? We learn more following a recent commemoration. Plus, a Hualapai tribal council member tells us how her nation is addressing food insecurity. And a new motion picture looks at tough issues facing youth, including sex trafficking, foster care, and missing and murdered relatives. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach, and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start with a new order from the Department of the Interior calling for more efforts to restore large bison herds to native lands. Secretary Deb Holland announced $25 million in federal spending for bison conservation last week. The funds will support the transfer of bison to tribal lands and improvements to glass to grassland ecosystems. The order also requires adding a tribal leader to a group exploring new herd establishment on both tribal and federal lands. Across the U.S., 82 tribes now have more than 20,000 bison in a total of 65 herds. Choi Heinart is the executive director of the Intertribal Buffalo Council. He spoke to ICT about more tribal collaboration. We're hopeful that the Department of Interior, um, you know, works with us and and helps us get the resources out to tribes and and you know tribes are able to use up the buffalo the the way they see fit and you know get it into their school lunch programs or diabetes programs elder programs and uh, you know start to reconnect uh, to who we are. On Saturday, March 11th, the annual Indigipop X, which is largely considered the Comic-Con of the indigenous community, is taking place in Oklahoma City. Dakota McDowell Wapakichi was on site ahead of the upcoming event. Oklahoma City will be a hub for indigenous folks as the home of this year's Indigipop X or IPX. This three-day event, which kicks off Friday, March 10th, will serve as an opportunity for indigenous communities from all over to share their contemporary and modern voices. This event is really just celebrating everything that Native people are doing in contemporary pop culture because so often we're portrayed in historical context and not really in the contemporary. So Most Comic Cons around the United States don't have strong Indigenous representation, but here at the First Americans Museum, that'll be different. Like typically when you go to a convention, we are like the very minority, like there's one or two of us. Um, so we still want to include um, those people in our community as well. Um, we have over 60 vendors, um, and those are just like as a vendor booth where you can come like shop from, bring your products to have them signed. Ferris says there will be other attractions. We'll have the 501st uh, Legion, which is uh, the Stormtrooper uh, cosplayers. And for those interested in physical fitness, uh, we'll have um, a glow stick ball event Friday night, so you can come out and kind of see uh, indigenous futurism with, uh, you know, stick ball but with glow sticks. Gintry says a big reason for having IPX in the newly built museum this year is because the location and events have similar ideologies and representation. We aren't just those um, spaghetti westerns, we're not just a southwestern look of what we've always been portrayed in a historical manner. Um, and so those kind of missions of both organizations are really exemplified here at First Americans Museum and through IPX. Anyone wanting to visit the Native Pop Culture Festival can visit indigipopx.com to get tickets. In Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Dakota McDowell-Wapakichi, ICT News. 
In Ontario, Canada, the legal journey to amend a class action settlement for survivors of Indian day schools has begun. The claims deadline expired for a 2019 settlement that was established to compensate these survivors. That agreement set the claims period at two and a half years with the deadline of mid-January 2023. Last week, six nations of the Grand River as well as survivor Audrey Hill made their first court appearance. Together, they called for the Canadian federal Liberal government to extend the claims deadline to December of 2025. They say COVID-19 hindered the claims process as well as a lack of culturally sensitive support and a short timeline. The action is being challenged in another proceeding before the Federal Court of Appeal. There, survivors are seeking a declaration to amend claims to be more fully compensated for their harms. Well, the most famous sled dog race is back again for this year's competition. The Iditarod kicked off last weekend and will continue throughout March. Crowds gathered by the thousands in downtown Anchorage, Alaska to celebrate mushers sledding around city streets. There are four Alaska Native competitors in the running this year. That includes Yupik citizens Peter Kaiser and Mike Williams Jr., Denina Athabaskan citizen Richie Deal, and Anupiak citizen Ryan Reddington are also competing. Brent Sass, defending Iditarod champion, readied his sled in preparation for the obstacles and weather this year's race could hold. It looks like there's going to be pretty mild conditions as far as the uh, temperatures, but the, there's been a lot of uh, wind out on the trail and a lot of different fluctuating temperatures on the coast, and so they've went from icy trails to snowy trails and back and forth all season. So I think we're going to get what we get. I try not to put too much, uh, too much uh, weight on what they tell us now because it changes as we go down the trail. This year's roster includes only 33 racers, the smallest competitor number in the Iditarod's 51-year history. To track the latest from the indigenous mushers, visit ictnews.org and search for Iditarod Notebook. An indigenous artist in California is teaching history through a massive piece of artwork. Cahia Band citizen Gerald Clark created a walkable maze shaped like one of the baskets his nation is known for weaving. Clark is known for his small and large-scale art addressing native identity and how it overlaps with U.S. culture and politics. His piece is titled Immersion at This Year's Desert X. People who enter the basket maze will have to answer indigenous trivia questions to get to the center. ICT arts reporter Sandra Shulman, who covered the story, talked about the connection the Cahia Band has to the area. The majority of the Coachella Valley, where Palm Springs is, is owned by the Cahuilla Band. Uh, they own almost all the property, the big businesses, beautiful parts of the desert and the parks. So the idea was to make the land a part of the art. The art installation where you can find this giant basket maze runs through May 7th in Coachella Valley. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. During the pandemic, lockdowns highlighted many vulnerabilities in tribal communities. For the Hualapai tribe, food became even more of a necessary resource, especially because some stores are located almost 50 miles away. Since then, many efforts have been made to give food to those in need. Emergency Operations Manager and Hualapai Tribal Council member Cheyenne Magenti plays a large role in addressing food insecurity within the tribe. She joins us now virtually. Hi, Cheyenne. Good morning. It's wonderful to see you today. Start off by giving us some background on where your tribal nation is located and how many citizens you all have. Okay, so we are located in Peach Springs, Arizona. That is on the west rim of the Grand Canyon. And currently we have about 1,200 people residing on the reservation and about 2,900 um, members. And you work in the emergency management within the tribe. Can you tell us about your role and history in helping your community? Yeah, so currently I work as the emergency operations liaison for the emergency operations center. Uh, a large role here is 
trying to prioritize and see where all our resources and our departments can come together and uh, establish like planning, preparedness, mitigation in times of emergency. But we really want to focus on um, preparing for emergencies right now. And I understand during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, you created the volunteer group called Helping Hands for Hualapai. Tell us about that. Yes. So that was just a little volunteer group uh, consisting of just my little family of six. Uh, we had been receiving donations from a church group from our local town that's located 50 miles away in Kingman the First Baptist Church of Kingman, Arizona, they were bringing us donations at least once every three months. Then it kind of scaled up to twice a month. Um, and we actually built up large enough to where we were able to give once every Tuesday. Um, it was a really great operation. And um, unfortunately we did have to end because they became a partner with St. Mary's and uh, with the, the guidelines that they have to follow, they couldn't bring donations out here but in turn, we also became an agency with St. Mary's. So now we have those services that we can provide to the Wallapai community now. Maybe share a little bit about how much this food is needed for community members who live in such a rural area. Maybe talk about, you know, the current nature of food insecurity for your tribe. Absolutely. Even when I was growing up um, young, we had to utilize uh, food banks and um, donated items. But our, our closest food bank, again, was 50 miles away. Um, and sometimes you don't have transportation. A lot, a lot of uh, issues has to do with transportation, people not being able to go to the grocery store or um, be paid on a weekly basis. So it's biweekly pay here. So just trying to get from one paycheck to one paycheck is, uh, is one of the main issues here. But we see that... Um, we're battling it head on now that we have this contract and agreement with St. Mary's. Uh, they're able to come every second and fourth Wednesday of the month um, and provide more items other than just donated. Donated items, you really don't know what you're getting. But now that we're an agency, we actually can get dairy products, meat products, um, dry goods. And uh, if we need uh, any emergency water or drinks or anything like that, we can just put in a request and they'll bring that right out. Aside from these food banks that you're talking about, what are other ways or what are other discussions that you're currently having to address um, this big gap in your community? Thank you. So I also sit on the Wallapai Food Security Committee and we are having talks of uh, introducing community gardens. And this is also going to be a new um, project with St. Mary's, they've never done it before, is helping out with the community garden projects. So we want to utilize all the empty areas between the neighborhoods and turn them into street gardens. So that way those neighborhoods can kind of just go grocery shop in, in their own local uh, vicinity. And we can also teach the children how to be a little bit more uh, independent and how to care for plants. And uh, see, uh, I believe we're also going to be introducing classes on how to uh, cook with uh, traditionally grown foods. Very quickly here, I'm wondering how you incorporate the generations of elders um, in this kind of work. We know that elders are the kinds of people who really need some help in, in these types of areas. Absolutely. So we do see the elderly as our priority. So we do set aside uh, emergency food boxes just for the elderly right now. Uh, we do make it a priority to go check on them, especially in times of um, severe weather cases. Uh, just considering the winter storm that went on last week, we put in an effort with the public safety group to go out and check on our elderly, make sure they had food, water, wood, whatever they needed. Uh, but they are a main priority and we do want to incorporate them with the new projects that are coming up because they have the knowledge on how to take care of those foods as master gardeners. So we have reached out. I believe we have at least six elders that are going to be coming out and helping teach those classes. Well, elders, of course, are so important and we say hello uh, to all of those watching. Thank you so much, Cheyenne, for joining us today. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. 
The 1973 occupation of Wounded Knee made household names out of men like Carter Camp, Dennis Banks, and Russell Means. But women also played a very powerful role in the occupation. They were honored recently during the 50th anniversary commemorations of the seminal event in American Indian movement history. ICT's Shirley Snavy and Stuart Huntington were there. The Warrior Women Project celebrated the women who put their lives on the line in 1973 at Wounded Knee. The project gathers oral histories from the women of the Red Power Movement. Some of the veterans of the occupation were in Porcupine to share their stories. Lavida Yigo talked about the spiritual awakening she underwent when she joined AIM. I was not taught my Kiowa traditional ways. I didn't under know I didn't know I didn't know anything about my Kiowa ways, but it taught me when I went to Wudani of uh, the spirituality of what it was all what it was all about, what AIM was all about. And I wanted that. I was hungry for something for that. And I found it through the American Indian movement. I found my spirituality. About two hundred people came to Porcupine like Diane Bird, who left her teaching job in California to join the occupation. She returned to Pine Ridge for the 50th anniversary commemoration. I was part of security working with these guys, and they set up a radio, and there was um, little radios in every bunker, and we kept in touch with each other, and they would ask, and it was controlled. Um, there was a head of security, and the security would know where the people in the bunkers were and what level of fire to respond to, whether it was 100%, 50%, or hold your fire, period. Because we didn't have that many guns, and we didn't have that many bullets for those guns. We were surrounded by federal marshals, by FBI, with tanks, with all the latest weapons, like even from the Army, and we didn't know it, and, but we learned about that later. And all we had were like little rabbit plunkers, that kind of thing. Madonna Thunderhawk has participated in every major red power operation from Alcatraz to Standing Rock. She says it's no surprise to find women at the forefront. And when the red power movement came, you know, in those days, it was, it, your community was the ones that made those decisions and decided how things were going to run. So it was automatically a matriarchal system. Still is today. But we don't have to constantly make a big issue with it and run around and, you know, because it's culture, it's tradition. It's the way it is. Tradition, yes, but the women of Wounded Knee still inspire. Their actions in coming together and reclaiming their rights as Lakota warriors, Lakota matriarchs, they, rec they did that for us. They made a everlasting imprint on generations and generations, bringing back the strength and bringing back the ability for us as, you know, Lakota people to be able to be proud of who we are. Definitely found the women speaking today to be so inspiring. Uh, about a year ago, there was a, a screening, uh, a film screening at the Fargo Theater, and so I was able to sit down with Madonna and her, her team and her daughter, and, and so it was a very rich moment to be in, in the presence of uh, giants <laughs> that have paved the way for us. But yes, definitely find inspiration for them, from them, and hope to continue pushing the work towards justice forward for all of us. Pushing forward with a powerful message. I'm not only a survivor of Wudani, I'm a survivor of rape and abuse, domestic violence. I'm a survivor of those three. So I call myself, I used to be in a victim stage or think I was a victim. I'm no longer a victim. That's a good message. Yeah. And if you're in, if you're in that kind of trouble, get help. There's help out there. Get brave enough. Get courage in your heart to take a stand for yourself. That's what it's all about. And that's what AIM taught me. And that what, that's what being in Wounded Knee taught me, was to be more bold, speak up. Creator didn't make you a mouth and not say nothing, speak up.
that courageous act of defiance was the beginning of a new era. I was in high school in 1973. My parents taught at the Flandreau Indian Boarding School in South Dakota. Suddenly, after the occupation of Wounded Knee, we became proud of our Native American heritage. We learned to bead, a simple but powerful way to embrace culture. In Lincoln, Nebraska, Shirley Snavy, ICT News. A new movie takes on the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Millie's story starts with her mother's disappearance. Her anger follows her and puts her in some bad situations. Called The Gift of Fear, it is set in Northern California. Carly Kohler joins us today. She co-wrote the script with her father, Jack Kohler. Welcome to the ICT Newscast, Carly. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. So I don't want to give any spoilers away, but set up the film for us. Yes. So this follows the story of a native foster youth. She's in the foster care system and she was part of a gang, but she was moved to a group home. And when she goes to the group home, she becomes involved with a, a teen, uh, a dojo, and she has a coach. And um, that experience creates a new family for her. So when her gang comes back for her, and they want to take her again, she refuses them. And then as payback, they take um, her girlfriend. So it's a story of how she's trying to save her girlfriend. Millie sounds like a very complex character. Can you describe how you sort of came to uh, developing her character? Well, I have a background as a social worker. I um, worked for CPS for six years, and that really gave me the experience of working with foster youth and just really watching um, their resilience and their strength in the face of adversities. And um, so I, I got the privilege of working with some very strong native foster youth and as well as other foster youth who really shaped my idea of um, this character of Millie. Tell us about the other actors in Gift of Fear. So we were very honored to have Michael Horse um, as he plays um, Millie, uh, Millie's girlfriend's grandpa in the film. And we also had um, Justin Johnson Cortez who plays the MMU agent. He is also in an, um, a film right now, a series right now, Walker Independence. And we also were honored to have um, Issa Antonetti. She is an amazing up and coming actor. We're so honored to have her. And um, we were also able to have Laura um, Vallejo. So we, we had a really wonderful cast who um, gave us all 110% every time. And it was just such an honor to work with them. In our earlier interview, we heard um, one of the sources there from Wounded Knee talking about the violence that Native women face. How often was that a conversation um, when you were developing this film in terms of, you know, trying not to perpetuate those same uh, harmful stereotypes, but while also telling a story? Yes. Um, so actually, when we were coming up with this idea of making Gift of Fear, we started out with like, let's make a documentary. And um, it really all began with April Goforth. Um, she's been working with my father for a very long time. Um, she uh, runs the program Rise. And um, so she and my dad, uh, Jack Kohler, teamed up. And um, they were like, let's make a documentary about MMIW. And, um, and as we were collecting all these interviews, it was just really, it was like the pain, hearing all the family's pain, it was just very intense. And so we wanted, we were like, this is, these are really important stories, but if we present it in this way, it's gonna be really hard for people to hear it because it's just so, it has so much pain. And so um, we came up with this idea of doing a, um, a feature film so that we could still tell the story, but make it a little bit more um, involved and have some breaks from the pain so that the audience can hang in there throughout the story. Um, but one person in particular really helped shape um, the form of the um, script. And that's when we met um, Cola Shippentower Thompson. She's an MMA fighter and a wrestler and um, she's actually in the film as well. She plays the role of Keech. I understand that this film is set for several festivals, including one here in Phoenix, Arizona. Tell us about that. Yes, we're very excited. Um, we Yesterday, we were actually just at the Women 
Native Women in Film Festival, um, and it was amazing. It was our premiere, and we have the upcoming Phoenix Film Festival and then the upcoming Boston Film Festival as well. So we're just very excited to be at all these different um, film festivals and for the message to get out and to bring more awareness to missing and murdered Indigenous women. You mentioned earlier that Gift of Fear was written by you and your father, um, and I understand that this actually isn't your first family uh, co-production. Tell us what it was like working with your dad. Um, it was really fun. Uh, my dad and I work really well together. He wrote most of the action parts, so all the blood and gore. <laughs> That was him. Um, I focused on more of the foster care parts because that was real life experience for me. So it was easy to draw upon that. Um, but he focused on more of the, you know, fight scenes. That was that was his thing. I understand this probably took a lot of your time, but what other projects or initiatives are you working on right now? Um, we, right now we're just working on trying to get a distributor. So we're going, we're doing the film circuit. We're going to all the different film festivals um, to get more awareness. Harley Kohler, co-writer of The Gift of Fear, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.